Thank you. First of all, good morning, and uh, thank you for the introduction, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's see if it works. Excellent. So, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, just to give you a little bit of my background that will give you, that will already um, tell you what the flavor of this lecture will be. Uh, so my background itself is in applied mathematics and uh, uh, theoretical neuroscience on the one hand side. On the other hand, as you see here, I'm a director of an INSERM institute, and INSERM is the French National Institute of Health. Yeah? So uh, medicine and uh, mathematics meet. And this is also expressed in the title when we talk about from HPC brain models to clinical applications, which actually Sandra has chosen, <laughs> and, or someone, or one of the organizers has chosen, and I found it very appropriate. And in order to set the stage to show you what we're talking about, I would like to show you a video first. And here you see one of our patients in Marseille. It is a video. She is being implanted with intracranial electrodes. The seizure has just started. Yeah. It is, careful with the sound, yeah. What you're seeing is a sequence of behavioral patterns. The patient coughs. Do you see the coughing? It is repetitive. She touches her nose. She's rocking back and forth. And the nurse is coming in, trying to interact with her in order to see to what uh, degree she's capable of interacting. T uh, pull your lung, a tongue. She's able to pull the tongue out. Yeah, and we have arrived at the end of the seizure. Do you see uh, the bandages underneath of set of the seizure? Yeah, underneath you have the implanted electrodes. And this is what it looks like. Yeah, so these are so-called stereotactic EG electrodes. They are about uh, that long, with ten measurement points. So these are macro electrodes. They are spaced. Three, roughly three millimeters, two, three millimeters uh, in size. And here you see their organization on one hemisphere, two on the other, and a representation in three-dimensional uh, physical space when we use some of the tools that we have discussed earlier and reconstruct them in three-dimensional physical space. In order to show you what has happened in there, uh, 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 I'll show you rec the uh, recordings that have been made, and each of these points here provides us with a time series. Yeah? And these time series are actually plotted here over time, and we're talking about 20 to 30 seconds of the video that you have just seen. And on the behavioral level, this is the evolution you have seen. Coughing, touching the nose, singing, rocking, etc. Yeah? And actually, the first indices of seizure onset you find in these areas, which is highly prefrontal. Look at the bottom left, down here. Yeah? And then you have onset of uh, high frequency oscillations with lower amplitude in these areas here, which means you have a spread and seizure recruitment. Propagating further, you see low amplitude, but high frequency oscillation. And this is actually here in the temporal lobe spreading out, reorganizing itself spatiotemporally, increase in amplitude, the waveform changes, etc. So what we're talking about here is a spatial temporal phenomenon on the system network level. Yeah? Multiple reasons why I'm showing this to you. On the one hand side, uh, it emphasizes the network character of uh, uh, seizure propagation, but also of activity. Activity in general, it is of oscillatory nature, it is of spatiotemporal nature, it is very difficult. Yeah? So we need to uh, be able to deal with this type of phenomena and not just compress it into individual uh, metrics. What is a good metrics to characterize this? But it is also accompanied by behavioral primitives, motor primitives, uh, if you want to say, that are expressing themselves during the seizure. Obviously, it's pathological, but the motor primitives themselves are not pathological. 
Yeah? And they find an encoding and representation in this activity here. Which part is pathological? Which part is physiological? What can we separate? Is it separable at all? There, there is a big bunch uh, of questions we need to address and that we are facing. And um, one of, uh, we have to make decisions also on which level we would like to address it. So on this representation here, one way to address it is on the network level, not necessarily on the cellular level, because we are measuring large populations of neurons. And we talked in previous uh, presentations, we talked about a parcelization, pers uh, parcelization of the cortex yeah, and subcortex in individual elements that be, can be considered in, if you add, in addition, the connectivity as a network. But then we are re, uh, on a population level. And this is roughly the granularity that is important for the surgeon. There are different parcelizations that exist. And uh, the, the one that Jan showed earlier, there you had, it was actually a large scale parcelization where uh, uh, there are big, uh, the temporal lobe has a large parcel like this. It's impossible for a surgeon to work with. You need a smaller granularity in order to make either an incision or a resection. And resective surgery for this type of patients that we are implanting is effectively the, at the moment, the clinical routine and only hope for, uh, um, uh, for uh, bettering their own uh, situation. 1% of the human population is epileptic or has shown some time in the life uh, uh, signs of uh, epilepsy. A third of these, uh, this patient population is uh, drug resistant and for their own, for, uh, uh, for them the only hope is resective surgery. And essentially the current approach nowadays is you have from investigation of this type of dynamics, you have to find the epileptogenic zone in which the pathological activity of highly oscillatory nature emerges, organizes itself, and then propagates to other areas that are the so-called propagation zone and does not touch other areas. The propagation zone is typically healthy tissue that is being recruited. The target for surgery is the epileptogenic zone. When you look here, which part of these areas are now propagation zone and which are epileptogenic zone? This is a type of decision that has to be made and ha with uh, large consequences uh, for the patient because it will, uh, it is being taken uh, in the, uh, it takes part in the decision making of uh, the therapy. So um, what I want to show you here is what the approach that we have taken over the last f roughly five years essentially and I will touch upon different elements that are um, making use of the different platforms within uh, HPP and establish a workflow that gets us from the imaging of individual patients through all the way to the pa patient specific interventions. And uh, the workflow is the following. From non-invasive imaging, we reconstruct what we call nowadays the, an avatar. This is the geometric form of the brain network. So we take a network approach because our target for, of investigation and intervention is a spatiotemporal organization, the spatiotemporal spread of the seizure activity. From diffusion uh, tensor weighted imaging, we can extract uh, the connection topology. This is a topological feature. And from uh, the MRI, we can uh, reconstruct uh, cortical and subcortical surfaces and have to make decisions about the parcelization. Then we have a form. This form needs to be equipped with function, which we do by e equipping it with uh, mathematical models that we assign to each brain region building a functional brain network model that establishes an in silico platform that we can use autonomously to generate signals as if it were brain imaging signals we measured during the patient. There are two ways of personalizing this. One we already have in there. This is a connection topology that enters in here. It's patient specific. 
Is it in fact informative, this information we get from the patient and implemented here? This needs to be demonstrated. This is one line of research. Another form of personalization is there are uh, this additional information we have about the patient. It, uh, if there are, for instance, uh, lesions or other anomalies in the MRI, structural information, we can use it and bias the parameters in the model. In fact, everything we do has to be expressed through the parameters, the mathematical parameters in the model once we are on this level. Yeah? Because this is the characterizations of the patient, which means we need to data fit or fingerprint the patient where we use machine learning approaches uh, in order to estimate the best parameters, in particular for the epileptic patient, the epileptogenic zone for uh, the patient, which again is expressed uh, through the parameters. Yeah? So their machine learning, deep learning methods uh, from this domain are being applied. Then we can use, once the uh, brain network model is personalized, we can use it for simulations to simulate seizure propagations specific for this patient and his or her brain network organization. And this we do on our in silico platforms to make patient-specific predictions, such as this is the epileptogenic zone, and the neurosurgeon operates upon that. This is a workflow. And I will guide you uh, step by step through various levels of uh, uh, this workflow in order to show you the challenges that we face and some of the solutions uh, that we have uh, taken. So first of all, something uh, that needs to be understood is the following. You can perform the modeling on the cellular level and then build very detailed models. This is one approach. You can also, in parallel, you can collapse a large population of neurons into neuronal populations that then are described by collective variables. It's in the spirit of statistical physics where, uh, uh, in the sense of thermodynamics for instance, where we have collective variables such as heat or temperature that are being described on a macroscopic level of organization even though they are generated by microscopic variables. Yeah? So, uh, this is inspired by statistical physics techniques which we, uh, such as mean field modeling. Yeah? And uh, so this is one uh, aspect that we use in brain networks. And then uh, we equip the network node models with these mean field models. And another aspect that is important on this level of organization, I will not talk about, but I want you to be aware of that. On this level and only on this level, if you do believe that oscillations matter in terms of communications between brain areas, then they, you need to take into account time delays because a time delay can shift an oscillation from in-phase to anti-phase, for instance, and thus change the nature from excitatory to inhibitory. Yeah? This happens only on this level, uh, on the full brain level, because there are the transmission delays can within one meter per second in terms of transmission speed, let's say 10 centimeters length, you can get time delays on the, just on the order or on the magnitude of 100 milliseconds, which means they do matter. Yeah? Um, for some of the mean field techniques, I'd like to show you uh, some uh, results. Um, here, this here is an uh, empirical paper by uh, Rafi Malach's group uh, where intracranial measurements in the human have been performed with microelectrodes showing some spike trains of action potential discharges, LFB macroelectrodes, and you see that so the density is represented, is actually a, a nicely correlated of the action potential discharges uh, with uh, the density of the, uh, you find here in the local field potential. Yeah? And when you smooth the spike train and overlap it with the gamma power of the LFP, you see a very nice correlation. Yeah? You can mimic this or something similar like this in uh, silico, in models, where you can build small-scale models composed of individual populations, build it 
uh, uh, through spiking neurons, and here you see the action potentials that have been generated on a time scale of 100 milliseconds. Here you have the uh, density uh, represented. You use an arbitrary connectivity of the individual pot uh, uh, populations. Um, and this is some work that is coming out of my lab, uh, headed by, uh, th this work has been headed by Damian Battaglia in my lab, and he has shown in particular that you can replace the density profiles here by individual oscillatory models mimicking the behavior very well. And this is the spirit of mean field models, that we can then collapse the very detailed information, depending on the question you have, in lower dimensional models that helps us to perform the simulation of a full brain network model of the human today. Yeah? Which means we have a huge information reduction and complexity reduction from very large dimensional system to mean fields that then be uh, characterized by a few collective variables. Using tractography, we can reconstruct individual brains using the MRI here for the surface and for the subsurfaces. We can reconstruct the surfaces. We co-register this. Uh, use the same parcellation for the tractography and get a self-consistent brain network model defined in three-dimensional physical space. One aspect I want to emphasize here is that for doing so, we use only structural data. And that is important because that allows us in this model, we can put in sensors, electrodes, wherever we want. We are not constrained by the initial choices that have been made through data recording, through functional uh, uh, recording techniques, such as electrodes. So we're not basing this on functional data, we're basing it on structural data, which means we have here an avatar which we can now equip with mathematical models that, we're, that we can stimulate wherever we want because it has not been biased by the brain activity itself. That was one of the motivations. Typically resolutions, if we are on the brain region level, are on the 80 to 300 regions, or we can go much higher dimensional also with a resolution of two, three millimeters when we are in the range of about 20,000 uh, uh, vertices or points, then we have a spatial resolution of two, three millimeters. There we have to take um, intracortical activity into account plus cortico-cortical connectivity, which we refer to as uh, the connectome nowadays. Yeah? Here we use only the connectome. Putting this together, the mathematics coming from mean field modeling on the one hand side, the structure on the other hand, provides us with differential integral equations which are autonomous. Autonomous means we can put them on a high performance computing cluster and we can solve them and generate brain activity uh, independently of the experimental functional data. So uh, uh, psi is our vector containing the state variables of the collective data. Then on a network node, we have our popul uh, mathematical re representation of the population activity, intracranial activity where, uh, sorry, uh, connectivity, and cortical-cortical connectivity, which we obtain from the DTI, where the uh, connectivity function undergoes the transmission delay I spoke about earlier. So in the context of the epileptic patient that we use here as a use case, the goal is to identify parameters in here which represent the notions of epileptogenic zone and propagation zone in the network that we discussed earlier. There are two ways now to connect uh, to other ongoing efforts within the Human Brain Project. One way is rather than using mean field representations, we, can, uh, we, we are taking hybrid approaches where parts of the network nodes we keep as mean fields and others we connect to uh, using NEST, which is a uh, simulator of spiking neurons 
uh, we use the high dimensional representation of spiking neurons. Here you have an example of the firing rate of spiking neurons for a particular region of interest. And for the others, we use the mean field representation. So that allows us to go to detailed physiological models today. Another approach is if we uh, say we do not care at the moment about the physiological implementation, but we care about the diffusion of activity patterns through the network as we saw in the epileptic patient in the beginning. Yeah? Then you just need the activity signatures for the individual networks and you can take approaches based on uh, nonlinear dynamics, on first principles in mathematics, nonlinear dynamics and statistical physics that just mimic the individual activity patterns that are patient specific in a low dimensional fashion and communicate the information correctly. And this is what I will po uh, uh, dwell upon later in more detail. Here you have a, a representation of a surface in a trajectory in a uh, brain activation space. We refer to something like this as a manifold with a flow on it. These are the geometric objects that we use in mathematics to describe this type of generic behaviors of individual mean field populations without direct connection to physiological variables, but sufficient to address network propagation. In the platforms, some of the platforms in the simulators that we use, uh, Everything that I have told you, and I'm going to tell you, you can do yourself, and it is available for download from uh, this particular website here. You can import the data, uh, your neuroimaging data, you can reconstruct the connectivity, you can build the brain avatar, either generic or uh, patient-specific, and you can perform the type of simulations um, that uh, uh, we have uh, seen here and that we will see in the uh, following about epileptic seizure propagation, resting state, etc. So here you see uh, snapshots of the um, user interfaces, but uh, you can go directly into the code. It's open source. It is available on the HPP collaboratory also for download and usage. So th these are the concepts. Uh, of large-scale brain network modeling I wanted to have shown you. Efforts are in place in order to perform uh, animal validation and there within HPP we use the mouse and we can perform the identical strategy of reconstruction, of parcellation, of extracting connectivity from DTI images of the mouse. We have mouse or rodent scanners in which we can perform the imaging and reconstruct the long range connectivity and the time delay. So it's the identical strategy. The mathematics is identical and we can reconstruct uh, also personalized mouse brain network models. Here you have some examples of uh, DTI images of the mouse using probabilistic tractography, which has some advantages and disadvantages. It's very diffuse due to its probabilistic nature. Deterministic pro uh, tractography is more uh, uh, sparse, but not uh, all fibers, in particular long fibers, are always well reconstructed. The advantage of the mouse is we can also connect to existing databases, here in this case to the Elm Mouse Atlas, where neural tracer injections have been used to uh, reconstruct individual fibers. There we know for sure that these tracks exist and we can validate our approaches uh, directly against that. Disadvantage here is it's not personalized. You need hundreds of mice in order to reconstruct the atlas. The DTI is personalized indeed. So that gives us essentially two tracks of validation, tractography and imaging in the mouse, following the steps we have just discussed about reconstructing the DTI data, building a virtual mouse, simulating neural activity, as expressed in the imaging signals, such as the Bolt signal, the functional MRI signal. And then we can quantify it. Here is an example of functional connectivity. We can do this also empirically because in here we can measure the functional MRI and obtain an experimental data set that then can be compared against the simulations. Or we can use gold standard data coming directly from 
the Elm Institute, uh, from the Elm map, build the mouse, build the Elm virtual mouse brain, simulate the data, and again, put it in the matrix for comparison and start validating the approaches. How good is personalization? How uh, many tracks are missing, etc. And this, just as a snapshot, when you compare the individual approaches, this year's scan, rescan variability of functional connectivity. Yeah? Uh, this is already at 55%. When we use the Allen mouse, we are getting actually to a reconstruction of the functional activity of about 50%, where scan, rescan variability is around 55. So this is not bad. And the best representations we obtain, in fact, from the deterministic diffusion uh, uh, weighted tensor MRI uh, and uh, the personalized connectome, as opposed to some generic uh, mouse connectomes, which is proof of evidence that uh, the personalization, uh, that there is some personalized value in the, uh, the DTI that is coming from uh, the individual. And then we can systematically start enriching actually the DTI by certain surrogates and investigate what is missing in the DTI connectivity, what has the most influence, etc. Yeah, so these are the questions we can pose. Coming to the network activity in epilepsy, just want to give you a glimpse of what is happening at the moment uh, because it is critical for the propagation of the seizure through the network and uh, the choice about the mean field model that is being placed on the network will determine that. And uh, since we focus only on the network propagation pattern at the moment, so our question is based on the epileptic orogenic zone, we have chosen a approach uh, uh, that is non-physiological, but mathemat mathematically solid and bio uh, grounded in the biophysical realism of the dynamics, not necessarily the physiology, because the physiology in this case is not our focus. And we decided at some point, uh, so about 10 years ago when we started that, we went through the literature and checked on the type of different models that are available when uh, uh, capable of uh, mimicking epileptic form activity. And here you have an example coming from uh, Fabrice's Wendling's lab, pre uh, activity, seizure onset, seizure organization. You always we are capable nowadays of mimicking this type of behavior, but you need something that guides you through the system, a slow variable that guides you through this type of behavior. And this is not good enough when we are interested in seizure propagation, because remember, distinction is epileptogenic zone versus propagation zone. So we went back to the origins and uh, started investigating the dynamic principles that are behind that. And I, I'll just give you a, a, a glimpse so you get a feeling for what this is about. Here, this is experimental data in tuto from Christoph Bernard in my lab. Uh, the time scale here is multiple minutes. Uh, this is the hippocampus showing pre ictal spikes and then organizing into a seizure event. I'm zooming into the second seizure event, so I'm zooming into here. And you see the seizure onset, fast discharges, organizing towards a spike wave complex towards the end, and seizure offset. Uh, when you look at this spike train, seizure train, one seizure, quiescence, second seizure, quiescence, and you go into the literature of mathematics, there is a very detailed mathematics that is called fast, slow systems that actually is organizing our thoughts and our understanding of systems that are displaying fast dynamics, slow dynamics, fast dynamics. And there are some generic so-called canonical models that organize all models available and providing some generic representations thereof. It always looks like this, and this is a representation of the manifold. You have a slow variable, uh, a slow manifold, and then fast discharges, and then back to the slow. And you enter via a bifurcation, which is an onset, and you exit via another bifurcation, an offset. So we are using this type of mathematics in order 
to describe, develop a uh, taxonomy of seizures because there is only a finite number of ways how you can enter into the fast uh, discharges and how you can exit. Only a finite number of ways. That organizes our understanding. Here you have the number of ways how we can enter. There are, uh, these are the so-called bifurcations. It gives us a 16-dimensional taxonomy, 16 classes. And here you see some of the events that are here. In fact, having said this, uh, there are very classic features characterizing the seizures and the individual seizure classes. Uh, at that time, the most prominent was this one, actually, that has a baseline jump. Do you see the baseline jump here? For the young research here, this here, a little story. At that time, we identified that this class is the most dominant class, actually, in the, uh, across mouse, across uh, zebrafish larvae, in the human. And this baseline jump, we could derive mathematically, it had to be here. I could simply not negotiate it away because I, uh, it is fundamental. But we did not see it in the data. Yeah? And uh, we did not see it in this data here either, in the human. So I went to Christoph Bernard and I asked him, Christoph, I, can we sweep it somehow under the carpet? Maybe it's hidden in the signal to noise ratio, uh, but it's not in the data, but it has to be there. So I'm at a loss, I don't know what to do. I uh, prove it mathematically, it needs to be there, but it's not in the data. What do we do? He told me all these here are as standard are being performed as AC recordings, yeah? which means a, uh, not DC recordings. As AC recordings, there are automatically some high-pass filters, yeah? which means by definition you can never see a, a baseline jump. So he went back into the lab, into the into to hippocampus, and he redid it, the studies. And this is what he found. These are the AC recordings in Tuto hippocampus. And these are now DC recordings with a baseline jump that I want to sweep under the carpet, but fortunately did not do. Yeah? So baseline jump in here, seizure evolution. And now he measured also potential candidates for the slow variable that we were postulating, purely based on mathematical principles. Here you have oxygenation and ATP consumption. I'm not saying this is the slow variable. I'm saying these are uh, quantifiers of some slow dynamics that was postulated uh, uh, from the existence of a most likely multifactorial slow variable. So that has led us to a formulation, a canonical formulation of a set of fast variables and a set of slow variables in the spirit of fast slow system based in mathematics where this is emergent uh, coming from all the microscopic activity that we have here. This one we can study systematically, and one of the key deliverables, deliverables of the SP4, the theoretical new science, is this map here, essentially, because there is only different ways how fast slow systems can behave and can exercise seizures. There are only certain routes that can be taken, uh, how one seizure can follow another one. Yeah? And this is anchored in the uh, fundamentals of nonlinear uh, dynamics. This can be now carried into experiment. And in collaboration with my colleague, Bill Stacy, who has collected uh, two th over 2,100 seizures in the human from six centers over, by now it's more than 100 patients. Yeah? Um, uh, he has identified the individual classes, and as we anticipated, the most dominant class is the one that I called earlier the saddle node homoclinic bifurcation. 75% of all patients fall into this category, 15% into another category, and others are difficult to identify. And now we can actually trace out the individual types of behavior. Here you have an example and can explain behaviors that have not been understood before through changes in terms of seizure types, for instance. It's not true that a patient has one seizure type. Yeah? A patient can have a variety of seizure types, uh, but it uh, can take certain routes through this space here that I have shown you before. Here you see an example of a patient intracranial recording where uh, uh, this patient gives the impression that the seizure is stopping and that is rekindling and reorganizing. Here you have the uh, ISI inter spike interval. It seems to be constant, and then at this point, 
it's actually increasing, which means uh, the frequency is uh, uh, going down. Yeah? And here you have the same thing about the amplitude. Amplitude is going down, and then something is happening, and it seems to be constant. The patient actually changes uh, his or her seizure type following one of the routes in this space that I uh, showed you before. Having identified now a canonical model that we can use to describe propagation patterns through the network, link it, it with patient-specific network, uh, so the geometric form of the network, the brain avatar, and its patient specificity, we can link it and we can now personalize individual brain network models for patients and use them. And this is how we are doing it. Um, this is a workflow I showed you earlier. We, and we go now through one particular patient that I want to show you in more detail. So this is the implantation that I showed you earlier. One hemisphere was highly implanted, two electrodes only on the other hemisphere. We take this patient, we uh, um, build the brain avatar using the tools I described earlier. And this particular patient had a, a hypothalamic hematoma, so a, a, a cell uh, population attached to the hypothalamus, uh, which was visible on the MRI, and that we, uh, that we represented uh, via a bias of parameters in the brain network model. We reconstructed her brain avatar, and uh, we used a high-dimensional reconstruction. Here you see the red dots are the individual points that we use uh, as brain network nodes, and we can stick in the electrodes. These are the 10 electrode points for the SEG electrodes, measuring the activity that is being generated on the source level. So this is a key distinction. We're not just working on the sensor level, but we're working on the source level, compute the forward projection on the SEG. That was important why we had to use structural data in order to build this brain and avatar. Yeah. Her data look as follows. So uh, these are experimental data, and obviously I have them only on the sensor level because the source level does not exist in empirical data. Well, you see a simple seizure here on the right hemisphere, and please note that in the rectangle, I'm integrating the energy that is in there, and we're scaling the radius of these little balls representing the electrodes. So you see this energy is mostly localized here. But please note also that the seizure starts and is localized on the right hemisphere, which is undersampled. This was the implantation has been decided based on scalp EG and quite a number of other uh, diagnostic factors in order to uh, implant a patient. The hypothesis was that epileptogenic zone is on the left-hand side. Uh, here I'm zooming into the seizure I just showed you, seizure onset, fast discharges, the spike wave complex we saw earlier, and seizure offset. This allows us to identify the seizure class. And here you see empirical data where, again, the seizure starts on the right hemisphere. Yeah? We had two uh, seizures during two weeks recorded that started on the right hemisphere and propagated to the left complex partial seizure, starting here and propagating to the left hemisphere, in particular here in the temporal lobe. Yeah? Um, here I'm showing you now how we treat the data, because uh, the, I told you it's a seizure propagation pattern. So we band pass the, uh, uh, we band pass filter the data, which gives us a representation like this, and we look at the envelope of these data, which gives us a representation like this, and this will become the data feature, namely the dissipation of energy through the three-dimensional network that we want to apply using machine learning methods when confronting our model directly with this type of data. This is the data feature that we choose. And uh, allow me to skip that. That is a little technical. In the clinical uh, decision making for the patient I have shown you the epileptogenic zone has been identified here propagating activity into these particular areas Ca using um, machine learning in particular probabilistic modeling on our clusters 
Uh, when uh, confronting it with a brain network model, these are the fits that we obtain. And now these fits are a epileptogenicity map, like a heat map, overlaid over the network, which represents the target for the resective surgery. In this case, it's bilateral, which means we cannot perform uh, surgery. Bilaterality of the epileptogenic zone is always a no-go flag for the neurosurgeon. Yeah? The epileptogenicity fits our parameters. Now we have a patient-specific brain network model. These are the simulations. Now, built simulations occur on the sources, and then we predict the SEG activity, and these are the patterns we, with one de a parameter set, which is patient-specific. So you see the, the virtual brain uh, model also represents the simple seizures where we can zoom in, also representing the complex spike wave pattern towards the end, with some pre uh, ictal spikes. But also for the same data set, we find propagations from the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere, exactly as we saw it in the patient. So in particular, going through the thalamus, you see some activations in areas where we have not placed any electrodes, starting on the right hemisphere, propagating to the left hemisphere, recruiting the left parahippocampus, left temporal lobe, and showing a very characteristic seizure propagation pattern. In silico, we can now test systematically the dynamic repertoire of seizure propagation uh, patterns in this particular patient. This can be quantified. This was one patient that I've shown you. This can be systematically quantified. First of all, here I'll show you first results for 15 patients. Now we are up to 30 patients, retrospectively. And first of all, what we have done with the mouse, we have reproduced here for the human also, demonstrating that the personalized connectome has the best predictive value for the seizure propagation patterns, number one. Number two, um, recognizing, uh, estimating, using the machine learning approaches I showed you, we can now predict for each patient the epileptogenic zone. Here you have an example, an exemplar in white epileptogenic zone, in red the propagation zone, and in green is the difference between what the virtual brain prediction was, namely either an additional area or a missing area. Yeah? Um, uh, so uh, either an additional or missing area, so the difference to the virtual brain prediction as uh, confronted with what actually the clinician has executed also in the surgery. And this is very interesting because now we can go back and look at the surgery outcome and compare, quantify the size of this green area, which is a discrepancy between the clinician's interpretation and the virtual brain prediction, and we can map it across seizure outcome. Seizure outcome, uh, sorry, surgery outcome which is measured by the angle score. Seizure free, angle one. Angle two, some seizures left. Angle three, no improvement, or it could be actually worsening. And there is a positive correlation, indicating that if we had followed the virtual brain prediction, at least statistically speaking, on the group level, it should have been a, a, a better surgery outcome. And this is important, because when you recognize that surgery success rate has not improved over the last 50 years. It depends, uh, uh, of course, on the type of epilepsy, but if you average all types of epilepsies, I have only images for the last 25 years, but if you look at the statistics over the last 50 years, it has not improved. This year is significant. And that allows us actually the justification to carry this into a large-scale clinical trial, which will start on January 1st next year, 2019. All tools are in preparation at the moment from pre-processing, data uh, pre-processing, organization, modeling, the personalization yeah, uh, of the brain network models that we need in order to predict via machine learning on the uh, HPCs, the, uh, the epileptogenic zone of the individual uh, patients, all this is being put in place now where there's going to be a software freeze by the end of this year in order to run the clinical trial. The clinical trial is, involves uh, 11 hospitals in France. They will measure, they will provide 400 prospective patients, which means what will happen is they provide the data, we virtualize them, 
We uh, identify the epileptogenic zone, we provide the clinical report, and it enters back into the hospitals, entering into the staff meeting, the clinical decision making, and into the surgery room. And actually, there's going to be a clinical trial. In this clinical trial, half of the patients will be informed by the virtual epileptic patient, and the other half will not be, in order to have the statistics to compare the success, the change of the success rate of the surgery with negative virtual epileptic patient information versus positive virtual epileptic patient. And we need about the 400 patients in order to have sufficient statistical uh, uh, evidence. Yeah? So this closes the loop of our, what I wanted to show you, essentially, going from individual images through mathematical modeling, high performance computation and neuroinformatics, all the way back into uh, the patient room. Other approaches are ongoing, looking at stimulation, for instance, or development of uh, novel surgical procedures. And having arrived here, please recognize all this is not uh, possible to perform without the close collaboration of our clinical friends and colleagues and a dedicated team behind that. Thank you very much. Thank you.